So this is the first year that the Ridley Gallery and the Art Department are collaborating in an initiative to bring real life artist examples to our students in an effort to inspire you and prepare you for artistic careers beyond college. It is an honor for me to introduce our second artist of the speaker series and someone who studied here and taught here at Sierra College, Chris Frazier. So as I mentioned, Chris Frazier studied at Sierra College and then transferred to UC Davis where he re received his bachelor's degree. He then went on to receive his MFA from Mills College. Frazier has exhibited his projects in many parts of the world, including all over North America, Europe, and Asia at various venues, including Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art in Arizona, the D Museum in Seoul, South Korea, and the Vitra Design Museum in Vail, Ein Rhein, Germany. He started his teaching career here at Sierra College and he is now the head of photography at Cranbrook. He's also a father who says that his son is the center of his life. Wow. So it is a pleasure to have you here, Chris, um, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. All right, thank you all for uh, being here and thank you for inviting me at um, Sierra College is such a big part of my life and I think you're gonna notice that through the talk. Um, I'm gonna jump right into screen share here. Uh, as Jennifer said, my name is Chris Fraser. And um, as I was saying, uh, Sierra College has been a big part of my life. Uh, Jennifer was mostly right about my biography. I did study at Sierra, but I actually did it after I went to UC Davis. My undergraduate degree is in history. And in order to finish out a degree that I was no longer passionate about, I took a photography class and I took it at Sierra with Dion Roberts in the summer of 2000, uh, and I got the bug. <laughs> uh, I got the bug and I stuck around for two years and it has put me on the trajectory that um, I'm on today. And so rather than, rather than digging too deep into that trajectory, I'm going to let it unfold through my presentation. This presentation is very much geared for students and not just students, it's geared for Sierra College students. Uh, I am digging up work I haven't looked at, some of it in 20 years, um, and I probably won't ever dig it up again. This is, this, is, this is me sort of following out my trajectory. Um, but before we do that, I, 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 I wanna, I've never dedicated a talk before, but I wanted to dedicate this talk to Rebecca Gregg. Um, I wouldn't be here if not for her. She was the longtime photo professor in the photography department. And she gave me the encouragement and guidance that allowed me to think of this as a possible career. And with that, I'm gonna give a little bit of, I'm gonna give a little bit of uh, some background to what I do before I jump into fully. Uh, this is a series of etchings, a series of three etchings done by Mario Bettini in his uh, Mathematical Philosophy of 1642. And it illustrates how a camera obscura works. I'm gonna be talking a lot about camera obscuras tonight. And I wanted to make sure we came across on solid footing. And so what we see here is the basic activity of how a camera works, all cameras on a certain level. Uh, light travels in a straight line, it passes through an opening and it arrives on the opposite side of the wall it passes through. So the top of the sun enters through the small opening in the window and ends up on the bottom of the room. The bottom of the sun passes through that same opening, ends up on the top of the room, and that's how we create images. Now, we don't just create images of what uh, scientists of this time called luminous bodies. We can also create images of things illuminated by that source. And here's a little soldier here, the sunlight's shining on him and his light is passing similarly through the opening, ending up upside down and backwards in this room. That's partially why I'm showing this to you, just a little bit of a sense of how does the camera work? Because that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, but what I love so much about this sequence of images is that Bettini didn't stop there. He sort of, he took it a step further and he thought, well, what happens when there's 12 holes through which light can enter. And what you get is the same image from slightly different vantage points over and over again. Um, 
my fascination is with pictures. It's with how pictures are made through light. And rather than focusing on images themselves, I focus on what makes the images. And that's what we're gonna get into right now. My most recent site-specific large-scale project was called Asterisms. I did this in the summer of 2019 in Bozeman, Montana. I got an email out of the blue from a, a, someone I had known in San Francisco back in the early 20 teens. And he said, hey, Chris, I'm living in Bozeman now. I've got a warehouse. We're putting on an art show. You have a proposal? And I did. Usually, usually I don't have a ready answer for these things, but I had done a project five or so years earlier where I had actually drilled some holes into the side of a building, images of the sun came through. I thought it was amazing, but it was very modest and I wanted to take over a building at some point. And so when this came through, I thought, yes, Eli, yes, I do, I know, yes, I'm gonna submit a proposal. <clears throat> Along with those images came a selection of pretty trashed out uh, images. This was a sheet, uh, a sheet metal uh, fabricating factory um, and it was very utilitarian. And so, but looking at these and looking up at the ceiling that I saw here, I thought, okay, I've got an idea. They sent me a floor plan with it. And I thought, I'm a little greedy when it comes to art making. Um, I'm gonna be perfectly honest about that. Uh, when an opportunity comes, I want all of it. And so I proposed that we knock down several of the walls in here and I would take over room three. Uh, and it would look kind of like this. I was gonna have everything torn out, all of the drywall torn out, all of the ducting torn out, all of the intermediary walls torn out. And I wanted to make something, something like a cathedral because I was really interested in this Renaissance process of taking cathedrals as they were already made drilling a hole into the top of them and transforming them into solar observatories uh, as a way of accurately understanding the path of the sun, the length of the year, and, and for their purposes, when, uh, when High Holy Days should be celebrated. And so my thought here was to do something similar. I'm gonna show you a little bit of a, a, little bit of a video here that I took from uh, online of just what I mean by drilling a hole in the sun. This is, this is uh, or it's drilling a hole in the cathedral to let the sun in. This is, um, this is uh, the Basilica of San Petronio in Italy. It's the, uh, it's the same church that, was, that I had the illustration of before. And this is, this is two days after the summer solstice. That's how the sun moves across the cathedral throughout the day. And here it's sort of at almost its apex point. Um, and it just passes and it passes that quickly. You actually, instead of looking at the sun as a picture or looking up at the sun briefly as, as it is, you see it as this image that moves in the world. It's kind of like a movie. And so I visited the site in Bozeman and did some tests for myself. I went up into the ceiling, I drilled holes into it. I spaced them out at various spots. I was testing how big the hole should be, too big, too small, just right. Um, and I got a sense of, okay, if I drill in this size and I space them this far apart, I can have this type of overlap. And that'll create this, this multi-pinhole experience. Again, if we're thinking back to those etchings I showed you in the beginning, um, I'm not interested in the single image passing through the hole. I'm interested in what happens when you provide multiple holes so that multiple images can enter. How does that reframe your experience of place? And so I went home, I plotted out sort of how I was gonna go about drilling holes in this large warehouse. Um, I made a panel for each of the openings in the ceiling. When put together, they add up to this, this sort of celestial, sacred geometry type thing with, with areas of overlap, areas of congruence. I printed these out on, on something like 1300 feet of sheet paper, two foot wide sheet paper. And then me and a, a handful of other, <clears throat> pardon me, a handful of uh, uh, workers went about the business of drilling 
roughly 10,000 holes into the roof of this 94 foot long, 30 foot wide space. And this is a little bit of, this is a little bit of a process shot, just showing you how things were going. And then what I'm gonna show you here is something you wouldn't see in person. I made a time lapse of this work with one camera facing east and one facing west so that you could have this experience about, of, of what it would have been like to be here in this space across the course of a single day. It's about three minutes long. My interest in making cameras is in, is in grounding people in where they are, is in providing an opportunity to call attention to the things that surround you, the things that are happening around you, but that are too overwhelming to see. It's, a, it's as though, it's, it's a little bit as though it's, it's the static, like being outside is the static in a radio station and you really just have to find the right channel before the signal comes through. And that's what I do. So that instead of taking you outside and saying, hey, that's the sun, that's the sound of the train going by, that's clouds passing overhead, I say, come inside. Let's look at these things as an image. Let's listen. And it gives, it gives, it gives the viewer, the participant sometimes, the ability to sort of take a step back from their ordinary expectations of how the world works in, to enter into this alternative, this alternative image space, to know the world outside you and to have this appreciation for it, but to, to do so in a way that isn't direct or mundane, but plays with the mundane and allows you to think about the world differently and think about how it works and wonder, what's my relationship to this? What's really happening around me all the time? And how can I take that how can I take this experience that I'm having here in this very sort of controlled art space, how can I take that and find it in my home, find it on my walks? And so what we're seeing here is roughly 10,000 suns tracing over the course of this, this, this uh, warehouse. They're passing through the rafters, they're passing on the floors, they're passing by the walls. And they all happen kind of, kind of inverted. The, the, the sun, if you're, if you're in the room, the sun, uh, the sun rises in the west in the morning and it sets in the east in the evening. So there's, there's, there are these interesting inversions that happen with any camera, but instead of bringing back a picture or taking a picture and seeing the image, you, you experience that image in real time and it reframes Hopefully, this is, this is my goal. Hopefully it reframes what it is you think the world is like and what it's made of and how it behaves. I've never shown this work to anybody before. <laughs> um, I was actually a little bit nervous before this talk. I don't get nervous before talks. But there's something about revisiting the things you made as a student that, I don't know, it's interesting. As I was saying at the beginning, I started, I started my career at Sierra College in the summer of 2000 in a class with Dion Roberts. And that's the, that's the work we're gonna see first here. This is the very first photograph I made. I had, I had been interested in cameras. I, I, had, I, I had been a ceramicist, uh, I, a lifelong drawer, but there was something about the process of photography that hooked me. It was going out into the world and looking closely at something. And then it was coming back into the dark room to develop the film and then to make the prints. Uh, and, and I can remember watching this first print come up. It, it's, it's, it's unreal. I think the difference for me between being a, a, a sort of 
happy amateur when it came to photography and feeling passionate about it was that sense that I was in control, that I was making these things. And so with this first photograph that in some ways can be seen as indicative of my path forward, that's accidental, um, looking at the mundane, looking at light, um, what it really means for me is that that sense of this is something I have a hand in. This is something meaningful to me. It, it employs my, my, my curiosity for looking, but it also gives me this tactile outlet. And all of the photographs I'm gonna be showing first here come from, come from this first year of, of making. <clears throat> They're fairly prosaic. This is my friend, Jamie. We took that first class together. I was interested in reflections. I was interested in distortions. Again, I actually made this photograph for Randy Snook's 60B class. Um, it's been a while, Randy. Uh, and um, you can kind of see, I've got a very formal quality about the way that I'm looking at things. It's fairly, it's student work, but it, it, it was student work that I was very proud of and that very much laid a path for me. And it was really after I had taken about a year's worth of courses that I started to look around at other photographers and what they were doing. And some of my early influences were Ralph Eugene Meatyard. That's the image on the left with the, the, the creepy kids uh, in mass. Uh, but I was also looking at Minor White, um, a, a very much a West Coast photographer steeped in the landscape tradition. Um, and I was looking at these things and I was trying to synthesize them and I picked up a medium format camera, an old camera. I like, I think for me, my interest in photography again was, was a very tactile interest. And I liked seeing differently and I liked holding things differently. So picking up this, picking up this antique camera was sort of, it was always gonna be part of my path. I was going to be finding things like this. And so when you see the pictures I was making with it, they sort of, they veer on that romantic Southern Gothic, moderately creepy angle, but they're also playing in nature a lot like Minor White. And this was me starting to sound out for the first time, what does an art practice look like for me? What am I doing here? Why am I making pictures? Why am I so hooked? Um, my interest in those uh, photographers uh, sort of led into an interest in the work of Keith Carter specifically and how he was trying to talk about what it's like to see the world as a human eye, not as a, not as a mechanical eye, but how, does, how, does, how can we start to mimic that? How can we start to show the, 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 the very fragility of human vision? And I picked up a, a, a less precise camera, still old, less precise. And I started making images that played with focus. Uh, again, this is sort of all part of an unfolding for me. It's not so much that ah, I've arrived or ah, this was a success. It was more like, I'm hungry, what's next? And I went out with this folding camera, focused it as closely as I could, left it on the widest open aperture and photographed and sort of took what came. And then finally, I was experimenting with a toy camera called the Holga, partially because it was cheap. It was a $16 camera at the time. And I thought, yeah, I'll, I can do that. I got 16 bucks. Uh, and I used it to photograph this image of a pile of trash near the train tracks in Roseville in color for one of Rebecca Gregg's uh, uh, color photography classes back when that was an option. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna sort of, this is, this is my, my post-Sierra time, but I'm gonna pick up on a lot of the cameras I was using. So my first three years after Sierra, I was picking up that antique folding camera and I was very much working in this sort of romantic, mythic uh, uh, mode where I was trying to take the things happening around me and trying to imbue them with a heightened sense of something, narrative, something like that. Um, looking at ruins, this was on a trip to England that I, that I went on. Uh, back in 2002. Uh, here I am back on the California coast, Point Lobos, where Minor White did a lot of photography, finding skulls everywhere I look, putting human hands in there, uh, walking down by the ravine in, uh, in Roseville, finding a wire stuck in a branch, finding the elegance in that. So you can kind of see I'm, I'm, I'm sort of starting to hone a, a, a way of working and a way of looking and a way of depicting here. 
Um, I was also very influenced by uh, the imagery of alchemy at the time, and I, I don't think I ever lost that. So when I saw this bird accidentally hanging from a tree, it, it very much felt to me like some heightened, like, like I, iconographic something, something in the world is not what you think it is, uh, spooky thing. And you're gonna see, I don't, I don't, I don't abandon that for a while. Uh, I picked up a view camera after that. I think that I was frustrated with the limitations of my camera. I was frustrated with always wanting to photograph with the lens wide open and never having a real ability to say, well, I wanna photograph something far away now. Everything always had to be like within three feet of me to work. And I just, I needed, some, I needed something more. And so I was also looking at the work of Sally Mann and Emmett Gowan. They were both using eight by 10 cameras. <clears throat> uh, they were both focusing on the family and they were both mythologizing family. And for me, that became another way of saying, well, you know what? All along, I've been interested in the ordinary, what's happening around me. But reframing that in a way that says, well, something interesting is happening around me. How do I show that? And so I picked up, and that's, that's, that's a generous term. I picked up an eight by 10 camera with an eight by, uh, uh, an antique lens. And I started photographing around my house. This work has never been seen. <laughs> uh, these are all just proof sheets because I didn't, I didn't stick to this for very long. <clears throat> I was attracted to the vignetting. I was attracted to sort of the distortions of the lens. I was attracted to the way it depicted light. Again, without having to sort of search out uh, 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 ruins in England or, or going through the, the rainforests of Hawaii. I was staying at home and I was trying to see things in a heightened way there. And all of this, I would say, was, was very much a training ground for me. It was, it was developing my sense of partially what it was like to have an art practice, partially what it was I was interested in, that very much being the mundane and trying to give a heightened sense to it. Uh, and it was, it was making me attuned to the world. If photography does nothing else for the photographer, it helps them see the world closely, which is invaluable. The eight by 10 was too big. Uh, I didn't want to take it out into the world. It was, it was just, it was, it was more than I wanted. And so I picked up, I picked up the toy camera again and I would hold on to that for very tightly for three years. And you'll see sort of my progression through that here. I often, I often describe this as the first good photograph I ever made. Um, it's the first thing I felt satisfied with. There was just something about it. It was, it was, it was the quality of light. It was the way formal aspects in the photograph aligned with each other. Um, it was the simplicity of it. It was the sense that I was just in a, I was in a, 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 a family friend's garden. I was wanting to shoot with the light in front of me and there was just this gift. And as soon as I made this picture and saw it, I thought, this is my camera, I'm gonna stick with it. And that's exactly what I did. Uh, this is, this is uh, uh, Jessica, uh, my now ex-wife. Uh, she was my accomplice in all of this. And we made lots of trips to Point Lobos where we saw that original minor white photograph and that actually tree branched to over the left side of her shoulder that's actually the same tree branch that he photographed in the mid fifties. And so there was this sense of continuity, this sense of homecoming, this sense of, of, of participating in a lineage, but also uh, um, transgressing against it. Again, with these photographs for me, it was, I had found my tool, I had found my subject matter, and it was a way of thinking, well, how does my life feel heightened? How can I, how can I make, pictures of it that make it that make not just my life but life in general feel like something beyond the ordinary something something besides something that should be ignored uh, this is my dog Laika uh, she had just been fixed with a cone on her head if you're familiar with the story of Laika Laika is the name of the first dog who went into space um, and when she wore this cone on her head and I photographed her I, I just looked at and I thought oh wow space dog um, and then I'm gonna, this, was, this is the last of the single frame Holga pictures I'm gonna show you. This is a self portrait 
hopefully you can tell that I'm a bit younger. Um, and, and the reason I include it is because of what's, what's passing over the left-hand side of my face. And it's, it's these images of the sun that are starting to poke through the Venetian blinds in my living room. I wanna take this back to that project I show you, Asterisms. Um, this is maybe 2006 or so. I was already starting to become attuned to the fact that my house was a pinhole camera. Uh, I was looking around and I was sort of noticing these things, but I was photographing them as sort of a prop to what I was doing and they would slowly begin to take center stage. I did a body of stitch work for the next, next year, year and a half, and it was all inspired by the work of David Hockney and his joiners. David Hockney is a painter. Um, he, will, he will not countenance being called anything else. He calls himself a painter, but I was incredibly drawn to his photographs from the 1980s where he would photograph individual parts of a landscape, just part, part, part at a time, and then come back into the studio and then lay it out on the floor and part of the reason I was drawn to it is because, well, the, the, the work's just gorgeous, it's evocative. But the other part was his interest in photography was perceptual. He wasn't trying to depict things to depict things. He was saying, this is what it's like for me to look at the world. I look at it a piece at a time and I construct it in my head. I construct it through memory. And so I took my Holga, which, if you're not familiar with the camera, it's incredibly deficient. Um, it's got a plastic lens. It's got the world's cheapest uh, uh, film crank. And if you don't crank it just right, you end up overlapping frames. And that's what I did. I wasn't gonna do exactly what David Hockney did. I wanted to work within the parameters of, of my Holga camera, but I also wanted to have that ability to say this happened and this happened but they're part, of, they're part of the same whole. And so this was one of the very first pictures I took. It's two of those frames put together. This one is three frames. Uh, one, of, one of my abiding interests is mythology. And I was, I was thinking, well, let's, let's make a portrait of Anubis, but everyone's gonna have a piece in it. It's gonna be Jessica's legs, it's gonna be my torso, and it's gonna be like his head. So this really offered me this way of bending space and a bending time and of bringing things in that didn't necessarily belong together, but through photography and through my memory could be called up to, to make these types of pictures. Uh, we lived over by Roseville Square and this is when, this is when uh, the Ross caught fire and burned down, for those of you who remember. <laughs> uh, this is, this is a, a three part image of my, me and my car after I'd gotten in a car accident, I would very quickly my back would seize up and I wouldn't be able to move. But you know, your car gets wrecked and, and you know you're an artist when your car gets wrecked and your first thought is, how do I get this back home so I can photograph it? Um, when your first thought really should be, let's go to the hospital. <laughs> um, lastly, I wanted to bring in another picture of those adjoining pictures of the sun. It became this motif. It became this way of saying, this is, this is a way of marking time. This is a way of marking place. Um, but here I'm going to show it as this continuity. My, 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 final, my final body of work here before I transitioned into, into what I'm doing currently was the same sort of work, but it was all done in color. And it was done in color partially because I was looking at the work of Larry Sultan and looking at the work of Philip Lorca de Corsia. Uh, but it was partly because I was applying to graduate school and I was starting to have this anxiety that contemporary photography wasn't black and white. I should be shooting in color if I wanna get in. If I wanna be a contemporary photographer, I should be shooting in color. All of those nonsense things that I was saying to myself um, as a way of working myself up into being a very rigorous, disciplined uh, artist. Um, and so I spent the six months before grad school doing nothing but color work and I applied with it. There are things I like about this work, but what I will say about it is that it doesn't have the same sense of enthusiasm. It lacks the joy that I felt in making the other work. It's a bit colder. Part of that is I was looking at a lot of work by Philip Lorca de Corsia. Um, but I think, I think a little bit of the magic had been lost here. And uh, 
I've never said that publicly. <laughs> the work was good. And I think the work got much more sophisticated, but in getting more sophisticated, it got less, got less joyful. And I think that that's where I would soon abandon this line of work because of that. And I would move on to other things. But before we move into other things, um, this was the installation. I showed this work at Viewpoint Gallery in the fall of 2008. Um, for me, the work and its installation was very much about this reconstruction of space, this reconstruction of memory, how we hold on to things uh, and, and the difficulties of doing so. All of which brings me to graduate school, pardon me. I started graduate school at Mills College in the uh, fall of 2008. I think that what I was looking for was more a, a greater challenge in my life. I wanted to, I wanted to be in an environment where I was being pushed by other people. I had, I had some, I had really great friends, really great colleagues in in the Sacramento area, but what I didn't have was was that sense of of of, of communal striving. Um, and I went to Mills for that. And it all began in Studio 208. Uh, this is me walking in for the first time, taking a picture of my studio. This is the first studio I ever had. You make art differently depending on spaces. This is, this is one thing I learned in this transition. I think that one of the reasons I so gleefully photographed at home was that home was available. It was, it was, it was the the common material of my life. I didn't have to go far for it when inspiration hit. I'm not a big inspiration person, uh, but when inspiration hit, it was there, I was there. Again, I've always had this, it seems like I've always had this interest in elevating the mundane, but, but to also have your subject matter be your life made, made the making process fun and, and just easy. I didn't have to think. But when I got a studio, the question was, what do I do with it? Um, and so my first, my, the first, very first thing I did in it was to turn it into a solar camera obscura. Again, all things come back. You think, you think you're reinventing yourself time after time after time, and then you realize, no, I'm just the same person I've always been. And so I made a little pinhole camera obscura in my window. And what I did is I photographed the position of the sun every day at the same time. And so the, that little dot of the sun was just sort of travel around the room and every day at, I forget what, <laughs> 234 or something. Uh, I would photograph it in place, make a print of it, photograph it in place, write the date, or sorry, write the date next to this circle, photograph it, print that image, and then put it into place where it was, sort of this, sort of this really overthought, overwrought camera obscura that tried to trace time. Um, and I followed it for maybe two months and I got bored and that's okay. It wasn't a very good work, but it was a really important work for me. It sort of got me thinking past, well, I'm a person who brings a camera with me into the world. Who am I if I'm in the camera? Which leads us to the, uh, an assignment. Uh, it was called Fabricated to be Photographed. It was done for Catherine Wagner's Image World class. Catherine Wagner uh, is a photographer and she was my, my main advisor at Mills College. And she had an assignment where she, it was made for all graduate students, not just photography students. And she said, you are to make something to be photographed. And then that thing photographed can't exist as a work of art in itself. You either have to deconstruct it, throw it away something, but it has to exist solely as a photograph. And I really struggled with this. Um, and at the last, kind of the last minute, the last minute for me, I thought, you know what? I really admire the work of Abelardo Morel. What he does is he goes into different buildings and he blacks out the windows and he cuts a small hole in it. An image of the outside comes in and he photographs that so that there's this overlay between real world and image world. And in this case, it's the real world of a hotel with the image world of Times Square on top of it. Notice that there's no cars, there's no people. In photographing this, he had to leave his shutter open for hours, probably eight, maybe 12 hours, 
in order to get the light sufficient to make the image into his camera. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna do that, easy peasy. And this is the result, it was easy. I bought some plastic at Home Depot. I cut a hole in the plastic. Picture of my backyard came into my bedroom. It was awesome. I went and I set up my camera in the corner of the room and I opened the shutter for two minutes and I took it to get developed and guess what? Not a thing was on it. <laughs> it was too dark in there. And I spent the next two weeks trying to get a good photograph of this. Again, for those of you uh, on the younger side, um, digital photography really wasn't up to the task of making high resolution, high output images. And so I was photographing with a larger camera on film and the process is just finicky. And so not only was I actively trying to photograph this for an assignment, I was also living in it. I woke up in a dark room with a picture of the world on my walls. And I had to secretly leave through this little sluice I made out of plastic in the doors and then come back at night, turn off the camera and then go back in and then I'd go to sleep here. And after two weeks of living inside of a camera, living inside of this image space, I started to have ideas. And one night I was sitting on the edge of the bed and I was thinking, well, during the day it's dark in here, lights coming in from outside and it's making an image. Well, I have the lights on inside now, it's bright in here and it's dark outside. I wonder if there's an image outside in my backyard. And I ran outside and I put my hand up to the little hole in it and, and there it was, my room was on my hand. And I ran back into the house and I grabbed a paint can that I had turned into a little pinhole camera and I put it on top of a floor lamp and out came a light bulb. And I can't, I really can't express to you how, how, how earth shattering this or, or just, yeah, it was mind blowing for me. I thought that I knew what photography was. I thought that I knew what cameras were. I thought that I, I thought that I was really immersed in this and had, had, had a firm grasp on everything. And I knew as soon as I put the pinhole camera on the light that I knew nothing. And I started laughing hysterically. <clears throat> For me at this point, it was this instant recognition that the camera wasn't a thing that receives pictures. It's not, even, it's not a thing you walk around with in the world. It's, it's this division between light and dark. And when there's light on one side and dark on the other side of something, an image will be seen on the dark side. And you can flip that relationship and make one side light and the other side dark and an image will be there. But it's not even just about that. It's that this is happening everywhere all the time. Pictures surround us. Pictures are everywhere. And all you have to do to see them is to create a division between the light here and create a dark space behind it and an opening of some sort. And you have this ability to reframe your experience of light, reframe your experience of vision, reframe your experience of photography, and, and, and enter into this new relationship to the visible world. And that's what I did. The remainder of my talk here is going to sort of chart that course of how I got from how, how I got from taking a picture of a cobweb on branches out in the field to drilling holes in a ceiling. Some of the first work I did after that was I would run around to light bulbs with tin foil in my hand, wrap tin foil around it and poke a hole with a needle. That was my art practice. I was the guy with tin foil and a needle. Uh, this is my bedroom. Those are little tungsten filament lights. I tossed tin foil on top of a flashlight, put it on a light stand and that's what came out. Again, it's, 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 my being in the studio, my being in the world became less about planning and became significantly about play. Tin foil on, on floodlights. That's what happens, crazy. I wrapped tin foil around a light bulb and then just started moving the tin foil around until the tin foil just broke into tiny, tiny pieces. And I just watched. I would just do this in my studio for fun. This time I actually set up a camera and photographed it. But there was something magical about thinking, hey, even tin foil is a camera. It's really, there, there's, there's, there's no boundaries here. Anything can be this thing. And, and the final work I'm gonna show you in this vein, although I've worked in this, this realm, I continue to work in this realm is 
I decided to fill a whole space with it. Every, every floodlight I could find on the College of Mills at, uh, in the art department at Mills campus, I borrowed from my studio mates, hung them all up, put, uh, put tinfoil around them, put the little hole in it, projected it, it was beautiful. And then you sit around it and you start smelling smoke. Don't cover light bulbs with tin foil. It's not smart. I ruined a lot of light fixtures doing this, but it was so worth it. Um, the next sort of avenue I wanna chart here, so that was my inverted camera. How does the camera become a projector? It's simple. I started trying to perform the camera. I think at this point in, in coming to an understanding that, that the camera obscura was nothing but a division between light and dark. I, I started to think, well, my shadow can make that. I can be the camera. And I knew this automatically because I was interested in the work of an artist named Thomas Backler. Uh, he was a German artist working in the 80s and 90s primarily who was turning strange things into cameras. And the strangest thing he turned into a camera was his mouth. And he'd put a little piece of film in his teeth and he'd walk up to a mirror and he'd make a tiny pinhole with his lips and he'd photograph himself as a camera. And I thought, oh, that's a great project. I'm already kind of, I'm working in this vein. I wonder what it would be like to do that. I'm gonna do it. Much like the Abelardo Morel inspiration, I thought I'm just gonna do it. And so I did it. I was, I, I started like I start everything. Uh, I'm looking out windows, I'm looking out my bedroom, I'm at home. This picture became this picture. This was, this was the very first photograph I made using my mouth as a camera, using my lips as the aperture, using my hand as the shutter. And again, TV, windows, laundry basket, they're all there, but they're indistinguishable. I got better. For every photograph I'd make, I'd do two. I wasn't sure if any of them would come out, so I'd always make two of the same thing. This is two of the neighbor's house across the street. You couldn't photograph the same thing twice. You could try, but being the camera, your lips are always gonna be in a different spot. Now, I'm sure all artists have anxiety. They don't wanna be the person who, well, that person already did it, they copied it. I don't wanna be copy of that. But what I'll say is that I think that this project was less about achieving something, good pictures, than it was about the undertaking. What does it feel like to be a camera? What does it look like when I put film between my teeth? In this picture, you can actually see the corners are my teeth. They're little shadows of my teeth. And you can actually see a, a, a bit of spit sliding down the piece of film. So it's this, it's this improvised camera. It's this, it's, this, it's this simple division between light and dark that makes pictures. And the only thing that, re, that the only reason I can report back to you about it is because film was in my mouth. Um, this process was amazing. It was so enlivening. Going through it, I really understood after this what it means to make still photographs, what the camera means, what it, to be still, to feel like you had to, to be blank, to remove yourself from the world. Like I'm in the world and I'm photog, I am the camera, I'm in the world. I'm, I, I'm very much in the world and yet, in order to concentrate, to like find that perfect position, it's a little bit like yoga, to find that perfect position, I had to, I had to clear everything out of my mind and just unbe. And I think that that was part of the joy and that was also part of the, the difficulty of the project was that I found, I, found, I found a little bit of dread in doing it. I found this little bit of dread in, in, in this, this constant embodiment, this constant re-performance of stillness. Um, I did about 500 of these pictures over the course of a year, and then I hung it up. Um, it was difficult, it was fun. And it was, it was so, so educational. But I didn't wanna stop at just my mouth. I thought, well, if my mouth can do this, surely my hands can. And so what I did is I bought one of the very early models of a DSLR camera that had, uh, HD video capability. And these first images here are sort of test runs. They're my still images. This is me using my hands. And you can see that there's a little bit of red tinge to the picture. And that's because, oh, I should, I should back up a second here. I took, I took the lens off of this camera 
and I put a body cap on it that had a hole in it and a little bit of glass because you really don't want to have an open digital camera out in the world. It really, it messes it up. Um, and so here I was making with my hands in front of this little camera, trying, inching my way towards pictures. And here you can see that the red tinge, the red tinge is there because the light passing through my fingers has blood in it. I started wearing black gloves. It took out that red cast. I probably shouldn't, I, I, in hindsight, you know, conceptually speaking, it really makes sense that this should be, whatever. Um, I was looking for pictures. I was aching towards pictures. This was my practice at the moment. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna show a video because the video really is the treat here. The still images don't do much for me. It's not that the still images are bad, but it's that I would sort of already gone through that process of seeing, seeing what the world looked like when photographed through my mouth. I really wanted to see what it looked like fluidly. And uh, here we go. What does it look like to actually be behind the camera, look through the viewfinder and actually see these pictures coming through and know that every, every slight change of position changes things utterly. I did this video while looking out a window in my house. Again, we don't, we don't veer very far from where we start. I'm looking out a window, sunlight's coming through it. Trees are blowing in the wind. And what I'm doing behind the camera is I'm trying ever so with, with incredible concentration to make my hands go into, it's like, what does this shape make? Oh, 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 I like, I, like, I like that one. Okay, hold it for a second and let it go. Hold it for a second, let it go. These two projects here very much exist for me uh, uh, in, in, that, in that previous realm of going out into the world, making pictures and showing showing that evidence to people and saying, look at this, this is what I did. Um, I made pictures with my mouth. Look at this, this is what I did. I made pictures, I made videos with my hand. Look at this, this is what I did. And what I began to realize through this process was that, again, I was in this position of, I'm doing these things, I'm learning so much through the process. I'm learning so much by actually embodying these things. And I show them to you and all you see is the end result. You weren't there along the way. You didn't feel that, that pressure of walk down the street with your mouth over your hand, your neighbors are looking at you, you're a weirdo. Um, stop getting anxious, saliva's running all over the film, go home. Um, so, so that, that just couldn't be communicated through this. And so what I ended up doing was I started thinking, well, how do I bring this level of interactivity into a shareable work? And that's what I did through this project right here, where I actually took that same window that I showed you at the beginning, where I put the little hole into it and the sunlight was coming through and I photographed it. And I stretched out that hole into being a gap, a gap roughly, roughly the size, roughly the width of my shoulders. So that if I walked in front of it, it would take this sort of elongated picture and it would squeeze it down as it's doing here into something that looked like what your eyes would see. Again, it's backwards, it's inverted, but it's still a person walking on the sidewalk. There's still trees. But it not only could be me doing this and it wasn't supposed to be me, it was let me invite people into the studio. I want them to have this experience. I want them to know what it's like to to actively be a camera, to actively participate in this image space that surrounds us all the time, but is so overwhelming that it's just invisible. It's so visible to the point where it's invisible. And I'm gonna let this get here to, uh, 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 there's a shot of me in a second here where I'm actually manipulating the image. This was all there was to it. It's a gap in the wall. And it's me trying out different motions. Again, it's not, about, it's not about getting the right image. It's not about getting the perfect image. It's not even about getting a specific image. It's about participating in this process of image making and, and sort of stepping back from, from, from that goal oriented, this is the image to, this is how images are made. This is, this is my stake in it. This is how I participate in it. And 
for me, this work here became that tipping point into getting me to work the way I do now. And I'm gonna very quickly run through this, this, this final phase in grad school for me. And I call it camera as architecture. I'm moving out of the realm of me making images to show you, me making videos to show you, me even wrapping up light bulbs. And I'm starting to think, how can I share an experience? This is the first sort of major work I did. Uh, one line drawing the view from my studio window. I'm gonna skip over a little bit of the, the backstory here because uh, uh, for the sake of time, I'd been looking at light, light was coming through, I was photographing it where it was and starting to notice, well, how does, how does architecture and light conspire to make images? And I was looking at the work of Maria Nordman and Gordon Matta Clark. And, and in saying that to you, I, I present images. Maria Nordman was a, a part of a movement called Light and Space. She was definitely working in architecture, trying to reframe an experience of light for people. Gordon Matta Clark was cutting up buildings. And I was starting to think about, well, what if I cut up buildings to bring in light? And I was, I was uh, up at the Headland Center of, of the Arts with friends. This is my friend Keija right there. And I was looking behind her and thinking, ooh, that gap in the wall is kind of cool. There's light coming through it. Wouldn't it be neat if that light were the whole, or that gap was the whole room? And so I did a little doodle on my phone just to remind myself. And I showed it to one of my other advisors, Anna Merch. And I said, hey, Anna, I wanna turn, turn my room into this giant camera that's just got these two mammoth walls on one side, um, but I'll do it someday. And she said, mm, you'll do it now. Uh, and I said, I don't know how to do it. She said, talk to Ethan in, in the wood shop. And I said, I can't afford to do it. She said, we'll pay for it. And so I learned how to do SketchUp. I modeled, I modeled this, this plan, and then I drew up some, some fairly basic uh, 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 framing plans, ordered the lumber. As you can see, it cost $319.92. This is an in-process shot. The woman on the left-hand side is about five feet tall. The ladder on the right-hand side is about 12 feet tall. So my, six, my, my ceiling up there was about 16 feet. And when it was done, it looked like this. Going into this, I kind of thought I was going to make something a lot like that interactive slit installation, like people would walk in, they would interact with it, this, that, and the other would happen. And in scaling up, that ability changed, but something new entered into it. The world became an elongated image of itself. The shape of the camera determines the shape of the image. Not only does it do that, but it becomes this, it becomes this frame for looking at the world anew. Again, I come back to this, this idea of looking at the world anew. Not only did you notice what happens when the world isn't, doesn't come through a pupil or a pinhole or a lens, but instead comes through a gap, it gets elongated, it gets stretched out. Um, when people would walk by, they would fan across the ceiling as these lines of shadow. And as the seasons would change, the green in the image would turn to yellow and then brown. And so this became a way of, of measuring the seasons, measuring the time of day, measuring activity, but not through specific images, but rather through these impressions, through these, through these, this, just, this just sort of sensual uh, uh, color display. And I'm going to run through this real quick. <laughs> this was my graduate thesis show. It very much works in the same realm. I thought, OK, that worked. I'm going to do it for my thesis show. The Mills College Art Museum has this beautiful Beaux-Arts ceiling, skylight. And I thought, OK, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to build a box. It's going to have a gap in the wall. Light's going to come in, and something's going to happen. <laughs> I built a model of it. That model became an actual space. The gap is where that, that little notch is. That's where the, little, that's where the gap in the, the room is. You walked through a hallway. You ended up in here. And this is what happened over the course of the day. The floodlights remain constant. That's the yellow. The skylight is the blue or the shadow. And as the sun moved across the museum over the course of the day, the imagery changed. This was in the evening. And this was at night. 
And, and for me, the, the, the installation wasn't so much about creating an image of anything in particular. Again, I don't, I'm not interested in, in particular things. I'm interested in here. And so the installation became a meditation on the gallery itself. The floodlights were lighting up other people's work. I didn't arrange them. That was accidental. The, the, the sun was lighting up the skylight overhead. I don't have the power to change that. And so it just became this way of, of looking at the gallery without being in the gallery, of being adjacent to the gallery, one step removed from it, but in a position to where you could see the world reframed in a new way, and hopefully to take that lesson with you into your life and to see these things into your home and, and to, to have a sense that the world's just a little bit more magical than maybe it's seen before. And that's the end. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity now to open up to our audience and see if anyone had questions. <laughs> I don't have a question, but um, that was amazing. Uh, Chris, I think you did a great job. You really inspired me as someone who's going in for crime scene investigation to kind of really pay attention to how I use the camera, how I capture what the main focus is. And you really did touch, like you just went above and beyond. And I'm really thankful for what, for how you worded everything and, and how you, you spoke about the beauty of photography and artwork and how we need to, you know, we have the power to create such beautiful um, photography work. I, I want to say like artwork and I don't know how, how to word it correctly like you do, but <laughs> it, it just, it opened up my mind to a lot. Like I, I, I view things differently now. Like I see the beauty in, in this world. I mean, I know, like I, I don't know, it just, it just really, opened my eyes to how powerful the, the lens of a camera and the photographer <laughs> can create such an amazing work. It just, wow, thank you. You're welcome. Thank I'm, you, Leah. I'm, I'm, I'm just, you're welcome. I'm just so <laughs> amazed right now. <laughs> can, can I take you to all my talks? <laughs> oh, you can. Yes, you can. Invite me, please. <laughs> I will be there because it just, it inspired me like you can inspire probably just about anybody you know and it's and it's funny like I'm not um I love photography and it's not something I want to do as like a, a a job but well technically it does correlate with the crime scene investigation you know what and I have to take pictures of the crime scene but like I know I don't know, like you really opened my eyes to really pay attention to detail and use my camera wisely, not just for my career, but like other stuff, you know, if I want to make an inspirational book or if I want to have like a, a therapy, like make myself happy. Mm -hmm. You made me want to go out there and now I just want to take a picture of like flowers from all over the world, uh, <laughs> people, random people. I don't know what it is. It's just, or like food. I love food. So <laughs> you really did man it was just that was just like so powerful is there a way we can um get a copy of this zoom meeting because i really need it or can i go to all your zoom meetings <laughs> sure <laughs> this is just incredible <laughs> like thank you i hope you become a professor for photography i'll take it even though i'm in one oh. right now but i'll take it <laughs> yeah. it's, just, it's great yeah, thanks, Leah. I, I know that the, this talk here is going to be posted to the Ridley Gallery website, so okay, um, cool. you'll, you'll get to revisit it. But I, yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to comment on what you said. I often, I often think about my work in terms of uh, um, perceptual training. That's, a, that's sort of a, a, a phrase that I, I, I glommed onto a few years ago to really understand, like, you know, I, I think that the works themselves are beautiful. I mean, that's what I pursue. This is, this is my joy. But I think that, that, that I feel works are most successful when people leave them with this sense of possibility, 
and not just possibility about what they can do, but possibility about what they can see wherever they are, whenever they are, that the, that the world sort of opens up just a little bit um, and, 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 and makes it just a little bit more joyful. Um, I will say that, that I taught for Sierra College for eight, maybe nine years. And gradually over that time, uh, my introductory photography classes would begin basically with me doing my studio experiments in front of people live. I'd turn the, the, the classroom into a camera obscura. I'd pour water into glasses and show how, how images were passing through the glass and how you could decode it um, as this way, partially of demystifying the camera, partially of laying it bare so that people could understand it more, but also as a way of saying, hey, this is your world. This is what happens in it. Enjoy it. Amen. Thank you. That <laughs> is just incredible. <laughs> it was, this was great. Thank you, Chris. I really feel inspired today. It's what I needed. Thank you. You are, you are my pet. I have today. a question. I have a question. Am I coming through? Please. Oh, hey, how you doing? Yeah, Tom? you know, there was this, <laughs> yeah, I'm fine, Chris. It's nice to see you. Yeah. Um, you know, there's this kind of evolutionary process about how you're treating the time and re relationship to light, you know? And you go through this thing in the last with your graduate show to this um, very sublime movement of a uh, very strong line form. Mm -hmm. And when I first came on, I was about 10 minutes late into this, but you were moving uh, and that you let the, you let just the circumstances of the day take care of it, okay? Mm -hmm. Bud lights in the room, sun moving through whatever. Mm -hmm. But then you went, how did you move from there to the motion and what appears to be like a little bit more, I, I, maybe it's not, but like a more controlled sense of how movement is taking place. Are you doing that first of all, or is it just still the same stat, uh, idea, but now you've got different forms that you're working with and ideas? Yeah, I, I, much as I said that perceptual training has become a, 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 a way for me to understand what I do and what my goals are, I've also over the past few years started to think about my works as instruments. Uh, a little bit like a scientific instrument, a little bit like a musical instrument, not something in itself that is a work of art, but something that facilitates the work of art to happen. And so um, with those later works, there was definitely a sense of, of, of increased control. And part of that, part of that's my personality, uh, mm -hmm. but part of that was also a sense that the, 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 the material I'm working with, light, is so incredibly subtle that any, any, any sort of tweak, any variation in, in how you construct the instrument changes the perception of it, changes what happens in it. And so what I found over, uh, over sort of my, my graduate school career was that while pictures can happen anywhere all the time, I can wrap anything I want into foil, I can go around waving my hands and make pictures, that the ability to share that experience with other people is really contingent on my ability to make the most quiet thing in the room achingly loud. And so when I started making those slit pieces, um, part of it was just experimentation, you know, trial and error. But once that I broke saw down this, a bit, oh, pardon me. Um, where did I leave off? Yeah. That, well, I, no, I just back there, you were talking about the, the thing in the room. And then there was kind of a distortion in the Zoom, at least on my end. Sure, so, I, I think could I Could you repeat I that one spot in there? Yeah. Where you were talking about that? <clears throat> um, I think I'm going to pick up where, where, where uh, I left off with that. Um, the material I'm working with light is so, so quiet that in order to make it perceptible to other people, to make it something that isn't just available, but, but persuasive, I need to turn, I need to turn down the qualities of the environment itself so that the light can, it, it, it's, it's more a matter of ratio than anything else. It's like, if light was brighter, I could have a messy space and it would still work but I have to make my space so exceedingly pristine, uh, tightly controlled, so that the, 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 the very subtle quality of light coming in seems big. It's not big, it just seems big. And so the rooms I, the rooms I made for, for the maybe five years, three, three to five years after grad school were 
these very tightly controlled uh, white cube environments where the walls are painted white, the ceiling's white, the floor's white, the gap through which the light is coming is, is a perfect half inch, whether it's spanning you know, six feet, 17 feet, whatever it is, it has to be just so, because if it's not just so, you're gonna ruin that sort of, the, sort of the spell that it creates, sort of the sense of precision that light's capable of if there's a sag in something or if something moves this way or goes that way. Uh, I know this through trial and error. I've tried to make them less precise. And when they're, <laughs> when they're not, they fail. When there's too much light in the room from some aspect, it fails. When the aperture curves, it fails. There's just, through trial and error, I found that it, it's partially about my desire to do something, but it's partially about the ability for my material to respond in kind. And so it's a give and take. I'm a Virgo, so I'm controlling. <laughs> But it's, light has light does what light wants, and in order to get our eyes to appreciate that, I work the way I do. All right, thank you. I have um, a couple of uh, questions from the, uh, the audience in the chat, and then Zoe, mm -hmm. I'll hand it over to you. I see your hand thank is up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so the first question is, do you think, and I think this one's a little bit related, um, do you think your process of experimentation over time that led you to what you do was inside of you the whole time, or do you think you developed over time into what you create? I, th I think it's a little bit of both. <clears throat> when, I, when I think back on what I do now, uh, um, or I guess I should say when I started to, when I started doing these works and I thought back on my life. Um, I remembered that when I was 12 years old, my family went to Ireland and we visited this, this place called Newgrange. It's a, it's a Neolithic monument a little bit north of Dublin. It was made around, it was made around 5, 000, 5 to 6,000 years ago. And what it consists of is it's this large earth mound, but this passage that goes through the center of it uh, made of rock and it, and it exits and it ends in this little like just a wall at the end of the chamber with this spiral at the end. And every, every morning on the winter solstice light, and it only happens on the morning of the winter solstice, light comes through the top of the, the doorway and hits the spiral in the back of the, in the, back of the uh, uh, chamber tomb and lets people know the days will get longer spring is coming, life will happen again. And so for me, when I think back on that and, and my, my sheer like joy at being there, it was about this sense that here were these people, they wanted to mark time, they wanted to mark where they were, they wanted, they didn't veer far from home ever in their lives, but they still wanted to have a sense of stability in that and a sense of of renewal, a sense of, of, of return. And so when I think back on that, I think that yes, I've always been attracted to the things I'm attracted to. Um, if you had asked me at age five what I was gonna be, I would have said an artist. Um, if you asked me what I was gonna be at age 18, what I was gonna be, I was gonna say, I'm, a, I'm gonna be a history professor, I'm very studious. But, but it turned out that I, I, need, I need this tactile engagement. I need, I love thinking, but I don't wanna think through words or writing. I wanna think through materials. And so the, the thing I'm doing now, no, I don't think I would do, I don't think I would be doing this, what I do now, if I hadn't taken a class at Sierra College in the summer of 2000, if I hadn't worked so closely with Rebecca Gregg, if I hadn't struggled on my own to figure out what it meant to be an artist, if I hadn't gone to Mills College and worked with Anna Merch, none of it happens. Change any one of these variables and it all falls apart and I'm doing something else. So yes and no. It was always in me, but the circumstances determined how it got formed. Thank you for that. Um, this next question kind of expands on that. Uh, what would you say to a person who is thinking about becoming a photographer, but is worried that they will be a starving artist and not successful? Any encouragement is welcome. That's real. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to go into the arts, you, you, 
uh, my best friend, uh, when she was going to graduate school, her mentor said to her, Keija, if you can think of anything else, do it. This is a hard life. And it's true. There's a reason that so few people in this world are artists and it's not because they're not talented. Talent abounds. It's not the talented person who makes it as an artist, photographer, whatever your medium is. It's the driven person. It's the person who's willing to sacrifice a little bit of comfort. My, one of my ways of making sure that I didn't sacrifice it too greatly was that I teach. I've been teaching since 2005. I'm not a rich man, but I pay the bills. And so for most people, I think that if you want to embark on this life, you need to, you need to plan for having a bit of an unconventional path. There's, no, there's only one wrong way to be an artist and that's to not make art. Uh, and there are so, so, so many right ways to do it. Um, I do it one way, I teach and I make. Other people sell art and they make. Other people, other people have supportive partners that enable them to step back from financial obligations and they make. Uh, and some people actually find a profession that allows them to make uh, uh, as a money-making activity and as, as, as a, a personal activity. Like there are so many ways of making photography work for you. Like it's amongst the media it has to be the easiest way to make money because there are so many people who need good photographs. You ever wanted to get into wedding photography, shoot two weddings a month and you can make art the rest of the time. Um, I know it's not as simple as that and you really have to have a temperament for it, but there are ways of doing this. If, if, if you're driven, if you're hungry, if you can't imagine a life without it, you can do it. It's not a given, it, it is very much self-directed. To, to my graduate students, I, I tell them fairly bluntly, being an artist is like being a small business person. You do it all. You are production, you're finance, you're advertising, you're accounting, you're advert, you, you, you do it all. No one's gonna do it for you. And it has to, the, 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 the joy of being in the studio has to be worth all of that effort. And for me, it is. If I was gonna give this up, I would have given it up in those really, really lean years. <laughs> but I wish you the best. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Zoe, I, I'll turn it over to you now for your question. I'll put my hand down now, lower hand. Hi, thank you so much hey, for Zoe. that. I, I don't know if Leah is still here, but... Um, basically everything that she said, that was a very um, uplifting, inspiring, informative um, presentation that you just gave. So I do wanna definitely say thank you. Um, I appreciate it as I'm sure we all do. Um, I don't necessarily know if mine is a question per se or an observation or something of that nature, but I don't think that I have ever heard someone describe their relationship with art and their craft and their tools in the way that you have and it it sounds like such a transformative relationship between you and your lens so to speak and I'm feeling this sense of and I could be thinking about it too much or too hard but there's almost like some sort of photography photographer inception with the gallery and with the lens and I'm just so curious about this because not only are your photographs and, and the eye that you have for your subjects, whatever they might be, not only are you allowing viewers to see those things from a different point of view as, as you know, you kind of create the subjects on space for them to be viewed very differently than you would any other picture of said object. Um, but you're almost like recreating what a lens truly means. And I think that's kind of what I meant by that photography inception and the way that you've made spaces, whether that's through your mouth or through the space that you created, those things, it's a, it's a, a double, it's a doubly different and intricate view of the photograph, knowing where it's coming from 
and kind of where your mind is at when you create that image. And I'm, I, you might have touched on this in the in the beginning, but did you realize that this was happening, or did it just kind of happen? It was that that innate drive to make it that way. Oh, thank you. That's the best question. Um, if it, it's the question, that question is something I had every intention of including in my talk, and just you know, you get in the stream of things and they they escape you. Um, the presentation I gave was tidy. I don't want to. I don't want you to leave this thinking that this led to this, led to this, led to this, and it was all just sort of like so easy and transparent. There was a lot of struggle. There was a lot of second guessing. Uh, there was a lot of wondering, what am I doing? Um, in hindsight, I can look back and say I was doing this. Uh, if I'm going back to those earliest pictures of, of the rocks that look like skulls, um, what I see in there is me trying to find magic in the world. Like, what's the underlying structure of things? How can I be so attuned to how the world works that I can find myth there? Um, and moving from thing to thing, I think that that, that, that desire to, to imbue the common with this heightened sense of being has been with me the whole time, but I don't think I noticed that until 10 years or so into it. It's something I can look back on and say, oh yeah, of course, that's there, that's there, that's there. Oh look, that first photograph you made, it's just light in a web, how poetic. I could have chosen a picture of a car or my dog. I mean, there's really no reason that I chose that. It's just a fluke. It makes things look linear and obvious, but none of it was. I don't show you the many more things I did. I left out a whole sequence of pinhole photographs, uh, uh, experimentations with making cameras that just wouldn't fit into the hour slot I had. It was just a matter of like, what can I tell you? How can I make this comprehensible? Um, and how can we get out of here on time? And it didn't make the cut. Um, and it's really important for me that you know that this is a struggle and it continues to be a struggle. Um, I was on this high from maybe 2008 to 2015 where everything seemed to go right. I could do no wrong. All of the work was great. And then 2016 hit. And I was like, what am I doing anymore? I can't figure anything out, nothing's going right. And part of that was that I, I had just come off of this really heightened period and I was burnt out and I needed to rest. Part of it was that I became a father and I wasn't sleeping anymore. And when you don't sleep, you don't think. And it took me a few years of struggling through that to realize that the process matters. Like, even though I know it matters, even though I teach that it matters, I wasn't honoring that for myself from like 2016, 17 and part of 18. I was just, I was really down on myself and I was wondering when something would be any good again. And then I just had to give myself that leeway of saying, no, 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 just be in it, be in the process, let things happen. And, and, and it will take care of itself. Towards the beginning of the lecture, I said that I really dislike the word inspiration. Artists don't wait for inspiration, artists work. Inspiration will find you if you work. Inspiration will run away from you if you don't. It's not coming, you have to run after it. And so that's, that's when, I, when, I'm, <laughs> when I've got my teacher hat on and I'm listening to myself, I remember that. But as I was saying to somebody else earlier, there's still those moments of doubt, there's still those moments of struggle Again, nobody's here to tell me what to do. I've got to figure it out on my own and I've got real high standards for myself. And when they don't pan out, I get depressed and it's real. Um, but another thing I'll say about this is that, um, and it was a, a point I wanted to touch on early on in your question, was that I, I feel like the work I make now is what it is because I started teaching before I started getting any good at art. I started teaching in 2005. <clears throat> and what it taught me was how to see people, 
how to listen to people, how to speak to people, how, how to appreciate their needs. And so by the time I get to that transitional point where I'm making the color, the toy camera color stitched photographs and I'm starting to think I'm making these for me and nobody else can really see them the way I see them. How do I get out of that and into a space where I'm actually addressing people where they are and I'm allowing them into my studio, so to speak? How do I take away that barrier of telling you what I've done and instead allowing you to do what I do? And so there are things that drive my practice. There are things that, that make it difficult. Um, but I, but I, 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 I'm constantly trying to remind myself that process is important and audience is critical not because I'm trying to please an audience, but because I'm trying to speak to people. I, I really want to be in conversation with people. I want to be understood. I want to have that sort of teacher moment through my work. Thank Great you. answers. Thank you. Thanks. Does anyone have any other final questions? I have a question if I Yeah, Yasmin, you had your hand up like the very first. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I it. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No, you're good. Don't worry about it. Uh, my question isn't as you know detailed as everybody else's, but first of all, that was a really great speech. Like Zoe said, I don't know if I think her name was Leah, right? I mm hope -hmm. I got that right. Yeah. But her answer was much more extravagant than mine, but that was an amazing speech. I was really inspired by it. I wanted to ask you about your art gallery at the beginning and mm -hmm. the video that you showed us from, I'm assuming it's a 24 hour period, but were you also filming it at night or were those just images during the day with the sun out? So um, I set up two cameras in the room and I set the interval timer on them and I set them to start at, at, uh, at, at uh, dawn. So oh. that as, as, soon as, as soon as even the slightest wisp of light entered the sky, the camera started going and they photographed once every 15 seconds. Uh, and they went for something in the realm of 17 hours because it was midsummer in Montana. Uh, and they, 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 the cameras stop at absolute nightfall. And so you get this, you get this, you get this sort of full course of the day. And in the middle of the video, there's also this point where things start to flicker. That was the one time of day that cloud cover passed over. Um, I've learned to appreciate that and to be okay with it because I, I photographed this situation seven times. I don't live in Bozeman, Montana. Yeah. I don't own two cameras. So this became a really like uh, difficult process, but I knew yeah. th this, is, this is a point in this where I should say the experience of being in these works and the experience of looking at them as photographs or videos is significantly different. And I knew what it felt like to be in the space. I knew what it felt like the heat coming in, the smell of the rain when it would invariably rain once a day, the mm -hmm. sound of the train going by mm -hmm. and walking around people and watching them staring at the ground or looking up and not really looking at you, but having all of these people sort of in this space of wonderment together. I can't show you that. But what I can show you is what happens over the course of the day. So, I can't show you what it's like to be there in a moment, but I can show you through photography and through video what it's like to be there over the course of the day. Now you can't do that realistically with your body. So this becomes this alternate means of saying, this, this, is, this, is, this is what happened. This is how we can experience something like this after the fact. This is how we can gain an appreciation for it, even if it's not that thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for me, truthfully, that documentation is the most successful documentation I've done of one of my works. It's the first time I've done a side-by-side -side panel thing where you actually got to see two things at once. Mm -hmm. um, and it was also easily the most difficult. It took me about three months to edit that video. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. Frame by frame. So there's 3,600 pictures for each view. Yeah. Frame by frame, I had to edit them to make sure the, 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 the exposure was consistent. So Tom mm -hmm. had this question like, like mm -hmm. a, a, about precision. 
I'm a very precise person, but I'm not a precise <laughs> person just for the sake of being precise. I'm a precise person for the sake of the experience so that yeah. if the video hiccups, if things go astray, you don't have that same experience of, of sort of transcendence and watching it. And so I have to, I have to sort of dial it that, that tightly in, in order for that video to work at all. Yeah. No, that's amazing. That was like my favorite part of your whole speech, that whole gallery and the, I really like architecture and stuff like that. So that whole part of the video was, or the speech was just amazing. It was so nice. Your whole speech was great, but that was what really got me. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and we have one last question from Rebecca. Oh, you're still on mute. Um, to unmute. Yes, I can. Oh, <laughs> I, it's, 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 it's it. the Rebecca. <laughs> it's the Rebecca, the uh, late Rebecca. Um, we were in the south of Sac and driving fast, but not... <laughs> not complete enough. So it's such a, I just have to echo what people said to you already. It's such a pleasure to see you via Zoom, if not in person, and also to hear you talk about your work. Uh, I wrote down so many phrases, imbue the common, you know, it, it's such a poetic <laughs> way that you talk about your work and the poetry that you make with light um, thrills me, inspires me. Yeah. And I'm so happy. <laughs> to see you and to hear you. I'm happy to see you too, Rebecca. You, uh, you missed the beginning of my talk. I dedicated my, I, 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 I dedicated a talk for the very first time in my life and guess who I dedicated it to? <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Well, with that tear dropping, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm holding it in. This is, this is why I can never say anything nice to anyone. I've just become a, a verklempt old woman. <laughs> uh, uh, so. since, since, since my boy was born, I can't hold it in either. It just comes out. Yeah. Just, <laughs> it will out. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Chris. And thank you so much, everyone, for continuing to come to these talks and being here to support us. It really means a lot to us. That was very inspiring. Um, especially talking about the process and focusing on that. So thank you so much. I feel like I need to go work in the studio now more too. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Right. Uh, I want to thank everyone here too. Um, it's been a pleasure. This is a bit of a homecoming for me. I, I, I shared more than I would usually share in a talk and I was, I'm always transparent but I don't usually go into this much depth. depth. Um, Sierra College holds a really special place for me and any time I can give back, I want to.